Yesterday's reading comes from the book of John and it can be found on 1509 and it's John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Lynn. Good morning. Lovely to see you all and Happy New Year. I didn't get to wish you Happy New Year last year. Now, did you know there's a very important day coming up Uh, This week, I'm not talking about Dudley again at 11 o'clock. That's this week, right? Okay. Uh, Very important day coming up this week. Anyone know what it is? Coming up this Friday. This Friday is Quitters Day, right? Did you know that was coming up? So the second Friday of January, this is the day by which most people have given up on their New Year's resolutions, right? It's Quitters Day. Uh, this coming Friday, uh, whether you read material from gyms or uh, cycling magazines or uh, Pilates classes, they're all writing about how you can get through Quitters Day without giving up your New Year's resolutions. Now, as far as I can tell, uh, whether you quit or not comes down to about three things. Uh, How important your resolution is, Uh, who you are, how you're shaped, uh, and whether or or who or what you're relying on to get this resolution done. Uh, Now, as a church, uh, as Mark has mentioned, we're thinking through Growing in Christ goals at the moment, uh, and we resolve to keep them after Quitters Day, you'll notice. Um, But uh, I wonder, as you've been thinking through uh, uh, goals, resolutions, Uh, Have have you picked something yet that you're going to work on this year? Uh, Because I've got something for you today that that I think ticks all these boxes. It's ultra significant. uh, It's key to who you are. uh, And it relies on the most reliable. Uh, So as we head towards Easter this year, we're going to spend time in the last section of the Gospel of John. And, And so one of the most 
productive areas in strengthening your faith, strengthening your sense of who you are, strengthening your prayer life, uh, is actually this, uh, growing in an understanding of what it means to be adopted by your Father in heaven. Growing in our understanding of what it means to be adopted into his family. And this is a growing Christ goal that will completely change, transform the way that you view yourself when you rightly understand yourself as adopted by your heavenly father. And it will actually change your prayer life. It will change your prayer life from being irregular, rote and formal to being ongoing, authentic and personal. I know many of us think, yeah, I've got a father in heaven, no big deal. Uh, but let me just read this to you uh, before I pray and we get underway. Um, uh, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Adam read some of this quote to us in November of last year. Uh, but this is what, the, in my mind, the greatest modern theologian J.I. Packer said about adoption into God's family. He said this, You sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes the thought of being God's child, having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook in life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. What is new about the New Testament can be summarised in the realisation of God as one's holy father. So friends, I want to persuade you today of this, that if you're a follower of Jesus, understanding your adoption by your heavenly father transforms the way that you see yourself and completely changes the way you interact with him. Uh, before I continue, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Would you pray with me? Uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, you are holy, you are glorious, you are powerful, and yet you care about us. And you love the ungrateful, you love the wicked. And we pray that today we would be refreshed in our understanding of, of what you've done for us in your Son and by your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the introduction of uh, this very dis different gospel, uh, the Gospel of John uh, that Lynn, Lynn read for us, uh, is all about Jesus. And there are a couple of moments here where you just get a glimpse into the new relationship that you have with his father uh, as a result of the work of Jesus. Now, of course, as we reorient ourselves to the Gospel of John, uh, we recognise this to be uh, true of the Gospel of John. The, the first three Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, are all quite similar and the Gospel of John is quite distinctive. Um, and one of the areas of the distinctives here in the Gospel of John is the focus on the relationship between the Father and the Son, uh, the, the amount of time spent there discussing it. Um, now, uh, this term, we're going to uh, get uh, to this last section of John and we get, get to delight in how God works um, as God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. We see that particularly in this final section uh, of the Gospel of John. And so today and next week, I just wanted to um, start at the beginning and start at the end of John, just reorient ourselves to this uh, great gospel of John. And so that's why we're starting at John 1, 1 today. And firstly, I want you to see this. Uh, when you receive the Son, you receive the Father. Have a look at John 1, 1 there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So, so Jesus is the word of God. He's been with the Father forever. Verse, verse 11, if you skip down there, it continues about Jesus. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So you see what's being said here. Uh, How do you become a child of the Heavenly Father? How are you adopted into his family? Well, verse 12, you receive Jesus. When you believe in him, you become a child of the Father in heaven. Now, I'm not sure that that is the first thought that we think about ourselves. I'm a child. As you think about yourself, you say, Dudley, Dudley is. What would Dudley say? What would you say? Would you say first, I am a child of God? Because we think about ourselves by our occupation or our previous occupation, by our generation, our age, or by the team that we follow. We think about ourselves by many distinctives before we think about ourselves as a child of God. But here we see being a child of God is crucial to our identity. It might be that you're all pretty new to this. Maybe you haven't committed to following Jesus. Um, uh, But what this means here is that the minute you recognise that Jesus is the final authority in your life, your king and your rescuer, through his life, death and resurrection, at that moment you are adopted into the Father's family. You gain a family, you gain a father, a father in heaven. It's not a natural birth. It's not human, a human like a human father. It's not as if you stop being a child of your human father. No, no, you pick up a heavenly father. You might think, well, that's about the last thing I need, another father. I've got to say to you, friends, your father in heaven, when you know him, trumps all conceptions of fatherhood that we have. All conceptions of what a father should be and uh, could be. And every time and every way, your father in heaven trumps these conceptions. Uh, For your Father in heaven created you. He is loving towards you eternally, not just momentarily. He is generous to you, uh, towards you, without limit. He sacrifices what's most important to him in order to have a relationship with you. That is how deeply you are loved by your Heavenly Father. Now, next, John comes to a bit that we're a little bit unfamiliar with, um, the bit about family rights, uh, the right to become a child of God. You see that in verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Uh, You get the rights of children of God. In society, we're more preoccupied, we're more focused on individual rights, um, equality, free free speech, uh, religion. Uh, more than family rights. Uh, But if you think back to Roman times, uh, if a Roman senator uh, uh, did not have an heir, um, uh, there was no one to take his inheritance, there was no one to carry on his very important name, what would happen is he'd go to some obscure orphanage uh, and uh, in the outer suburbs of Rome and, uh, 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 and, and pluck a child out of this orphanage and take this orphan into his family. So this orphan who had nothing to his name would come into his family, move from a place of having no rights to having the rights of a leading family in Rome. No privilege to all the privilege he could possibly imagine. No position to having a position in the purple end of town. Uh, The inheritance to come as his father dies. You see, brothers and sisters, uh, that's what you have as you've come into the Father's family. Um, We have the right of the firstborn, the the sonship kind of right. I know we're not all sons, but we we have the rights of sonship, uh, the hope of an inheritance. That's the kind of idea that we have adopted into this family. If you want to dig deeper into what you believe, the Westminster Confession is a great place to go. Um, as you have a quiet January, pick up the Westminster Confession. Um, this is what it says about the, the, the right to become children of God. It says of those who are justified by the work of Christ and adopted into God's family, that they enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God. 
have his name put upon them, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are pitied, protected, and provided for, and chastened by him as by a father, yet never cast off, sealed for the day of redemption, and inherit the promises as heirs of eternal salvation. That's the family. That's the adoption. That's the father that you have through the work of Jesus. Now, there are two really important implications for this. Um, The first is the way that you view yourself, your identity, your sense of self-identity. You can see how this completely changes the way you see yourself. You no longer say, first, I'm a tradie. You no longer say, first, I'm from that family. You no longer say, first, I I follow, you know, I sing for the Wanderers or I follow the Panthers. That's not the first thing you say about yourself or think about yourself. Instead, I'm a child of the creator of the universe. Nothing is more fundamental to you than that. Just to, just to sharpen this a little bit uh, as we spend time in John, uh, we see Jesus faces off with his opposition um, throughout the gospel and it gets more and more intense as we get towards the end. We saw that last year. Uh, just turn with me to chapter 8. And this is one of the battles in the middle of one of the battles that uh, Jesus has with his opposition Um, Chapter 8, verse 41. I'm just going to start from the second part of 841. You found it there? You see, I just want you to listen to the language of fatherhood that Jesus uses here. So Jesus' opposition in 841 says this. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Now, this sharpens it. It puts a bit of a sharper edge on who your father is, doesn't it? The father of belief or the father of unbelief, the devil, who wants you to believe his lies. It just sharpens who our father is, doesn't it? Uh, One of the women who, who, who became a Christian at this church in 2016 Uh, shared how she was racked with doubts. Uh, She didn't doubt Jesus' death. She didn't doubt Jesus' resurrection. Uh, But she doubted whether God could actually love her. Uh, But she knew herself well. She knew where she'd been, what she'd done, and she just doubted whether Jesus could, God could actually love her. I wonder if you've had that doubt before. Now, someone, someone in her growth group said this to her. 2,000 years ago, your sins were paid for as Jesus died on the cross. And that was the thought that really ministered to her. Uh, Whoever you are, whatever you've done, it has been paid for 2,000 years ago. And and so from what we see today, reflecting on the fatherhood of God, uh, we also recognise that 2,000 years ago, the way was made clear for her to be invited, adopted into the royal household of God. That's extraordinary, isn't it? What an immense privilege for her. In those moments that she doubts that God could love her, that she could turn back and know that God had already demonstrated in history his love for her. 
that his love for her as a good, holy, loving father for a child was secured 2,000 years ago outside Jerusalem. What a privilege. Now, that's the first implication here of being adopted into God's family. It changes changes the way that we see ourselves, the way that we view ourselves, uh, that we are loved children of our Heavenly Father. Like Jesus, we are dependent on our Father for all that he gives and we are obedient to him in all that he commands. It's like the old kid's song, trust and obey, for there's no other way, right? Now, the second really important implication here uh, for our adoption is this. Uh, prayer. Our understanding of father, the fatherhood of God also changes the way that we pray. So as we pray, we're not praying to a faceless deity like many religions in the world, uh, a divine being who is undecided on how they're going to act towards us today. That couldn't actually be further from the truth. We're actually speaking to our Holy Father. Uh, We're not doing a mechanical, superstitious practice to see if God favours us today. We're asking our Father who loves us, our Father who loves to give good gifts, our Father who has given us good gifts in the past. We're asking him. So we don't approach him with caginess, with reluctance, as he might approach a stranger for a dollar. That's not how we approach him. And sure, our approach is respectful, for he remains a holy and awesome God. However, in Jesus, by his spirit, we approach him with freedom and confidence. That comes from a loving relationship. I wonder if you've had this experience where uh, when people recognise you as a religious person, whatever that is, have you been called a religious person? Um, uh, uh, they're going through a tough time and they know that you're a religious person, so they ask you to pray for them. Um, I had a moment last year where a good mate who I've been praying for for almost 20 years now, uh, his child was very, very sick and I was on the phone to him um, and I said, mate, would you like me to pray for you? He said, oh, that would be amazing. And, and we prayed together And he texted me afterwards and said, that was so amazing. Thanks so much. Um, But in those moments, I'm sure you've had them where you pray. Of course course you pray for someone when they ask. But I'm sure like you, you think, "If, if if only you knew the father yourself, that you knew in this kind of time you could go to him and ask for his love and mercy. Because that's how we pray. We pray with relationship. So brothers and sisters, in in prayer, we approach our Father with freedom and confidence. Uh, Later this term, we're going to spend some time in uh, the prayer that Jesus prays in chapter 17 of John, which is just extraordinary. It's extraordinarily rich. There's so much gold there. So I I look forward to spending some time in, in John 17 with you. But let me for now pull this all together. When you receive Jesus as Lord and Rescuer, you receive the Heavenly Father. You are adopted into his family and loved deeply and given the rights of being part of this royal family of the sovereign creator and given the rights of being part of this family. Uh, uh, That changes the way that you view yourself. That is the most fundamental way that you could describe yourself. You're adopted into a loving relationship of dependence and obedience with him. And this changes the way that then you talk to him. This changes the way that we pray. We speak to him as someone we know who loves us and cares deeply for us. That is the reality of adoption. Now, I've I've shared this with some of you before, but I just want to share with you a story of adoption uh, just to illustrate what's happened to you. 
Um, this is a story of Russ and Maria Moore, who adopted two boys uh, from a uh, Russian orf orphanage. Uh, Russ says, when Maria and I first walked into the orphanage, uh, where we were led to the boys, the Russian court had picked out for us to adopt. We almost vomited in reaction to the stench and squalor of the place the boys were in. Cots in the dark, lying in their own waste. Leaving the end of them, uh, leaving them at the end of each day, Russ and Maria says, was painful. Uh, but leaving the final day before going home to wait for the paperwork to go through was the hardest thing either of us have ever had to do. Uh, walking out of the room to prepare for the plane ride home, we could hear Maxim calling out for us, falling down in his cot, convulsing in tears. Maria shook with tears. I turned around to walk back into the room for just a minute. I placed my hand on her head and said, knowing that they couldn't understand a word, I said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Russ says, I don't think I consciously intended to say the words of Jesus uh, in, in John 14, 18. It just seemed like the only thing worth saying at the time. Uh, when Maria and I uh, at long last received the call that the legal process was over and we returned to Russia to pick up our new sons, we found their transition from orphanage to our family more difficult than we supposed. We dressed the boys in clothes our parents had bought for them. My mother-in-law uh, gathered some wildflowers growing in the cracks in the pavement outside the orphanage. We nodded our thanks to the orphanage staff. We, we walked out in the sunlight to the terror of the two boys. They'd never seen the sun. They'd never felt the wind. They'd never heard the car door slam or experienced the sensation of being carried down the road at 100 kilometres an hour. I noticed that they were shaking and reaching back to the orphanage in the distance. I whispered to Sergei, now, now Timothy, that place is a pit. If only you ever knew what was waiting for you. At home with mum and dad who love you. Great-grandparents uh, and great-grandparents, cousins, playmates and McDonald's Happy Meals. Uh, but all they knew was the orphanage. It was squalid, but they had no other reference point. It was home. We knew the boys had acclimatised to our home, that they trusted us when they stopped hiding food under their high chairs. Uh, they knew uh, there would be another meal coming, that they wouldn't have to fight for scraps. This was their new normal, but... I still remember those little hands reaching for the orphanage. Of course, now they are no longer reaching for the orphanage because they are in our family, adopted, safe and secure. Brothers and sisters, this isn't a story about you, but it could just as well be about you, given that you've been adopted into God's family. That's what happened for you when you received Jesus as the chief authority in your life. It changes the way that you are. Now, of course, you still reach out for the pit that we came from, don't you? But it actually changes the way that we view ourselves and the way that we speak to our adoptive father. Even in his holiness, he becomes our father who loves to hear our prayers. So that, friends, is, is growing in our knowledge of adoption as children of God. Now, I know Quitter's Day is coming up just this Friday, but please don't quit on this. Don't quit on growing in a knowledge of God, your Father, who adopted you by the work of his Son and his Spirit. That's what we're going to spend some more time in John uh, uh, looking at as we go through these final chapters of John in term one, growing in relationship with him, speaking and listening. Friends, let me lead us in prayer. We thank you that you are our father and we thank you that your home is our home. We thank you that our saviour is our brother. We thank you that you, all who are saved are our brothers and sisters too. 
Uh, we thank you, Father in heaven, for plucking us from slavery, plucking us from squalor, from the pit, and adopting us into your family. We thank you for this and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.